Well, it is good to be back among you and be back here in this pulpit preaching God's Word. Uh, this has been such an amazing uh, sermon series on rest, and I wish that I had been here to hear the ones in July that you heard. But I, I was on a trip with my family, a motorhome trip to Mount Rushmore, uh, through Rocky Mountain National Park, and up through Yellowstone. And so our first, our first stop at Mount Rushmore, we saw, we passed this little cot group of cottages. And I said, Eric, slow down, I have to get a picture of that sign. Um, I was thinking about church and our series back here, instead of Rushmore, they've called it Restmore. So uh, a good reminder for me, while, even while I was on vacation, that uh, resting more is what the soul needs. So when we as a ministry staff were talking in spring about what this summer sermon series on rest would look like, the, uh, the concept of waiting rose to the surface. There are so many places in scripture in which God's people are waiting on God to act to overthrow an oppressive empire, to bring peace or healing in suffering, and, of course, then the big wait, to wait on God to come and bring the Messiah. And so God's people in those periods of waiting are invited to rest, to rest in God's promises. And that rest in the form of a surprise pregnancy is the topic of this story that we're looking at from Luke. So let's continue that story in Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 18. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know that this is so? For I am an old man, and my wife is getting on in years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak, until the day these things occur. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondered at his delay in the sanctuary. When he did come out, he could not speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak. When his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months, she remained in seclusion. She said, this is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's been 12 years since I have been a pastor, an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church. And it's been an incredible journey. When I first became ordained, I had a one-year-old. And I uh, was looking ahead at ministry and motherhood and wondering how that whole balance would take shape. And it's really been incredible to be a mother and a pastor. Those two vocations go hand in hand. I, think, I don't think there was anything to fear. But I do remember at that point, right, right after I became ordained and I was looking ahead to hopefully having more children, I said to a colleague, I'm concerned about being a pastor and being pregnant. It's one thing, some people, uh, it's hard enough for them to accept a woman being a pastor. But to have a pregnant pastor, I said, what? won't that be a distraction? I guess I thought it just feels so human and so exposed. But my colleague, Ashley, she was a single woman my age. She was a wise woman. And she saw things in poetic terms. And she said, oh, Betsy, I don't see 
being pregnant as a distraction at all. Being pregnant represents so much more. It re represents hope and life. Imagine standing at the graveside as a pregnant woman. You wouldn't even have to say a word. She was right. Being pregnant and a pastor didn't work mutually exclusive. I don't know that anyone even noticed too much that my belly was growing underneath my robe, even here in this congregation. But pregnancy and what it represents, I think that it's worth talking about. Not too long ago, I was talking to a, a member of this church, a young man or a young father, who said, I think what we're going through right now as a congregation feels a lot like being expectant parents. That there is a birth about to happen, and we don't know what that's going to look like. It's exciting, but it's really scary for a lot of people. I think he was on to something. And I say that because there are so many instances in Scripture where pregnancy and birth are at the center of the story. Like in today's story, Zechariah and Elizabeth, a couple who is getting on in years a lot like Abraham and Sarah in the Old Testament. And they had been wanting from their youth to have a child, and I believe they gave, had given up long ago. They had gotten rid of that dream and tried to move on with their lives. And then they are visited by an angel and told, you will have a child. And this is by the, the fulfillment, this will be a fulfillment of the promise of God. And so, Elizabeth becomes pregnant. Zechariah loses his voice for nine months. I think I love this story uh, uh, among the pregnancy and birth stories because they both have a gestational period. They both, in their bodies, experience this wait and see what God will do. Now, I'm aware that pregnancy and birth is a sensitive subject. It's one of the most sensitive subjects. I've never really talked about it in a sermon before. Because it hits a nerve with so many people. For some, pregnancy comes easy. And for some, pregnancies are very difficult. For others, it's a dream to become pregnant. And they're not able to. I am aware as a pastor of how sensitive this subject is. And I believe that Luke also, and the other biblical writers that dove into this subject, knew how sensitive a subject this was. Because having a child represented not only joy and blessing, but livelihood in the future. Luke knew that the longing, the ache for a child ran deep in people. And perhaps this was why he tackled it. Now Luke, I don't think, was saying in this story that, that the takeaway should be that a couple in their 70s can have a child if they pray hard enough. Or that any couple who deals with infertility can have a child if they pray hard enough. Luke was using pregnancy and birth as a metaphor for what the people of God, the people of Israel, were longing for. They had a longing, a deep ache, that God would come and act. And that kind of longing they had for a Messiah could only be described by diving into this sensitive subject of pregnancy and birth. 
Only that human experience of longing for a child so much that you will pour your whole life into it. And after you give up, you're still thinking about it. Only that kind of human longing can express the longing that Israel had for a Messiah. And that's where we are in the first chapter of Luke, when the people are waiting. It's with a longing. It's with an ache for God to come and bring salvation. And so I do think that it is apt to think of our own story as a congregation. This is a community longing that we share for God to act among us. That young father who said what our congregation is going through is kind of like pregnancy and birth. It was right on. We as a congregation right now are longing for God to act. We're waiting to see what God will do in this new phase of ministry. Now I know that there are many connections that can be made in your mind. When you hear a metaphor, that's the beauty of metaphor. There are many things that each of us is waiting for in life. Many different ways that we're waiting for God's salvation to take hold. But I want to explore this morning three responses that we have as a congregation when we see ourselves as people with that longing for God to act. We're going to explore that birth metaphor today when we think about our own life as a congregation right now, waiting for a new pastor, waiting for that new phase of ministry. So, when welcoming new life, first, we are to receive each day as a gift with awe and wonder. Now, Zechariah and Elizabeth, as an older couple, when they receive the news that God is going to come and bring birth from them, they are both filled with awe and wonder. Zechariah so much that his voice is taken away from him. So all he can do for nine months is to consider the promise of God and to watch it come alive in his own wife. The awe and wonder is to take hold while we wait, not take hold when the promise is fulfilled. Pregnancy is like that. Each day is a gift. The miracle, yes, is the birth, but the miracle is also the pregnancy. When a woman is growing a child inside of her, a human being, it is cause for wonder. So for us as a congregation, some of us, we just think, I can't wait for the delivery day. I can't wait for this pastor to come because then the miracle will begin. Then we'll be able to be who we are as a congregation. But the lesson here is that the miracle is in the waiting. The miracle is as we kind of stand hopeful. The miracle is being opened up and being able to learn in this time who God has created us to be. And so for, and maybe I'm preaching to the choir here because there are some people who have just said, I'll come back when that pastor comes. He'll see me again in worship. But I'm just going to hold off right now. We're called to be worshiping with awe and wonder, standing before this miracle that God is doing among us. Okay, second, when welcoming new life, resist the urge to rush. Surely Elizabeth, at some point in her pregnancy, thought, you know, I could deliver this baby any day. 
I'm ready. That's how it, how it is for pregnant women. And Zechariah, I'm sure, got very tired of writing everything he wanted to say on a whiteboard. But resist, resisting the urge to rush is to be our response. When we see ourselves as waiting like a couple, waiting for a child, everything within us, it wants to rush, but we're called to wait. God's promise will be fulfilled in its time, the angel said. For us as a congregation, there is this tendency to say, let's get on with it. Come on, why does it have to take so much time? But there is work to be done while we wait. We have to look at ourselves as a congregation, our own finances, our own giving patterns, all of that is a part of this gestation period. Figuring out who we are as volunteers in this congregation. How do I give my time in this place? What responsibility do I have as a single member of this congregation? That's something that each person is called to figure out during this time. Rushing won't do us any good. God's promise will be fulfilled in its time. And in the meantime, we learn who we are. We take advantage of that full gestational period so there can be a healthy delivery. You know that these scheduled C-sections are the thing now. That they've had to make laws in many states to say, we won't, do schedule, we won't schedule C-sections until 38 weeks for a 40-week gestational period because people were pushing to earlier and earlier to schedule their delivery. Maybe because of uh, someone's work schedule or a vacation schedule, a doctor's schedule perhaps. Or just because I'm tired of being pregnant. And we all know the wisdom of that full gestational period. And that's where we are as a congregation right now. You're going to be hearing after the sermon from Rebecca Madney, the head of the Pastor Nominating Committee, and she'll give you an update. Those updates are great. They're kind of like those doctor check-ins. Um, and you, you make sure you have these doctor check-ins because then you go, okay, I think I can make it to the next one. Resist the urge to rush. And finally, when welcoming new life, we're to expect change and trust that it's going to be good. Zechariah and Elizabeth were in for quite a change. They had their routines. They had lived their whole lives establishing their routines. And then a baby is going to come into their lives. And imagine John the Baptist as a toddler. I would guess he was a little more fiery than normal. <laughs> Expect change. That's the thing with the birth. We are getting ready now for something very different. A new phase of ministry that's not going to look like the, what ministry looked like around here 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 50 years ago. We are ushering in something new as a congregation. And so I want to say it now. We need to expect change. We need to expect things to be turned upside down. For the people of Israel, you think about who Zechariah and Elizabeth represented as the old guard of Israel. They were this older couple who represented Israel, who had their routines, they had the law, they had life figured out. And then the Messiah comes, this birth happens for them as a people, the Messiah comes, and all of a sudden, life is very messy. 
Jesus turned things upside down for the people of Israel. They had wanted a Messiah, but they didn't really expect change to the extent that it came. And that's where we are in our life as a congregation. We want, we want someone new to come. We're excited about it. But do we really expect change? In many ways, we cannot prepare ourselves for it except to take responsibility for who each of us is, to dive into the life of the congregation, to give our all. That's really the only way we can prepare and to be open, continually open to what God will do. The second part of that, trust that it will be good. This is getting a handle on the big picture. Now, Zechariah and Elizabeth, I don't think they really ever had an easy time as parents. It wasn't like they got, uh, they got to a point in John's life where they said, Oh, gosh, this is what we've been waiting for. Parenting so easy. It was a life of suffering that they entered into, or that they ended up getting into, stumbling into. It was a life of suffering. And the, what Israel hoped for in having a Messiah, it was a life of suffering. It was learning to suffer along with others. But in the end, this is how God's salvation comes. God is in control. And in the end, all will be well. And so in our little spot here in the universe at Hamblin Park, we can expect change. We can even expect some bumps in the road, even after a new pastor comes. But in the end, we are a part of something much bigger. God's plan of salvation for the world. And in the end, all will be well. And in that, we can trust. And so when welcoming new life, we receive each day as a gift with awe and wonder. We resist the urge to rush. And we help one another resist that urge. And we expect change. Trusting that because we serve the God of the universe, the Lord of heaven and earth, who came in Jesus Christ, all will be well. Amen.